Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is talking about the first and second letters of Peter, way over there, almost to the end of the Bible. And this is lesson number five in that series entitled, Living for God. That's an interesting idea. Do we know what that means? Do we understand what it means? That will be our challenge for this particular session. And this lesson is, is, for, the, uh, is for April 29 of 2017. And uh, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you once again, recognizing your presence with us and asking you to guide us as we think about these important ideas and the ideas that you inspired your friend Peter to put in the New Testament. May we understand them more thoroughly and understand what you want us to know from them and how they might impact our own lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So I guess the first obvious question is, what does it mean to live for God? Does that mean just um, to avoid sin completely, shun sin? Does it mean to be good, to do good? Does the, did the death of Christ solve the problem of sin? If so, then of course the question is, why are we here 2,000 years later? And the next question would be, how does getting to know God and, 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 and Jesus Christ change our lives? Does that have something to do with living for God? How do all those things fit together? Um, anyone want to solve the problem by just answering those questions right now? <laughs> <laughs> Surely the Bible writers understood the challenges of living sinful lives. I mean, think about Paul. He started out his life doing what? Very faithful Pharisee, and when the opportunity came, he was a, maybe the worst persecutor of Christians. And then after that, he recognized what a mistake he had made, and he spent lots of time the rest of his life apologizing and so forth. I think especially of, of 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. And let me see if I can make this a little bit larger so it's easier to read. This is a true saying to be completely accepted and believed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I am the worst of them. Now, do you all agree with that? Everybody agrees that Paul is the worst possible sinner? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Okay. Although he might have been at one time pretty bad. Yeah. At one time he might have filled the bill, right? Yeah. Well, the Bible writers seem to be pretty keenly aware of the difference that their relationship with Jesus Christ, that is, their faith, had impacted how it had impacted their lives. Now, none of them, however, implied that the new lives in Christ would be easy. One of our passages for today, 1 Peter 4, 1 says, Since Christ suffered physically, you too must strengthen yourselves with the same way of thinking that he had, because whoever suffers physically is no longer involved with sin. How, how does that work? Maybe we, do we need to set up some concentration camps and then that will purify all the saints? Well, the New American Standard in the margin says, Suffer death. Uh, for suffered in the flesh. Okay. Uh, that it's, uh, that would be I think it's implying uh, what Paul talks about with the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of Jesus and uh, how we go through that or we identify with him in that process. How does this fit with, I mean, just to throw all everything into the, into the pot here, how does this fit with Jesus' own words in Matthew 5, verse 10, Actually, and 11, happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And then happy are you when people insult you and persecute you, tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you're my followers. Be happy and glad for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. Does that mean uh, please persecute me so I can be happy? 
Well, the traditional word is blessed. Yeah. Uh, I suppose some would see happiness, but it, that seems, you know, where it says, blessed are they that mourn, happy are they that mourn, seems uh, kind of at odds uh, with one another there. Yeah. So I kind of prefer the blessed. I think, but, uh, I think we have to be prepared to handle the worst. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, are, are Christians... I guess there's two questions here. Are Christians supposed to be different from the world, and are they? Could you tell if they're really different? Well, if they're supposed to be, how do they get that way? Well, that's another question that's coming up in our lesson very shortly. Well, it sounds like, okay, as long as you're not like the world, you're okay. You're going to make it. <laughs> well, here, here's, here's my verse. You know this verse, and we've quoted it many times, John 13, 34, and 35. What is implied by these words? And now I, this is Jesus talking in the upper room, just as he's getting ready to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, we understand that love is probably the main criteria of Christianity, but... If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you're my disciples. Now, I don't know, but that sounds like Christians ought to be really different. Yes. Yes. So we're in favor of that, huh? The thing is that the text you, you read a little while ago, you have to think like him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. You have to think as Jesus did if you want to do or act the way he acted. Mm -hmm. All too often we put the accent on the action, not on the thinking. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. time we reverse yeah. that. Yeah, and, and it, that was implied by something I read just a moment ago. Is the key here to being like Jesus or is it just to acting like Jesus? Or is there a difference? It's being like Jesus, it's which means like thinking him. like him means partaking of the same spirit. In other mm -hmm. words, what's driving our thinking and our action. Uh, because if it's less to the flesh, less to the eye, or boastful pride of life, then uh, our thinking is going to change and our actions are going to change. Peter goes on to say something else that's a little puzzling. In verse 8 of that same chapter, First, uh, first Peter 4, Above everything, love one another earnestly, because love covers over many sins. What would that mean? See, I think we have to be careful not to look at love or consider love as a sentiment or a feeling. Yeah. It's a principle. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that it's a principle, it's something we must learn. A sentiment is something we have naturally. A principle is something we have to learn. Mm -hmm. We have to learn what love is mm -hmm. or else we can never become loving. Jesus is the ultimate teacher. Yeah, and ultimately, of course, that has to be the agape kind of love, which is completely unnatural for, for human beings. We're naturally, inherently born selfish. To, to, to think of others before we think of ourselves is just not natural for human beings. You know, there seems like nowadays that people are worried about being... Um, I can't even think of the word, word but um, being different or being queer or being no, 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 the, that they're they're being um, man, I just can't think of it. Okay, well, well let me let me say out. something while you're thinking. Of okay, it. <laughs> <laughs> not eating. All right, uh, in Proverbs ten twelve, it says, "Hatred stirs up strife." But love covers all transgressions, mm -hmm. which is a similar thought, and that may but be Peter was probably quoting. Right. Okay, I so, know what it is. So you have the, the stirring up of strife and versus love uh, calming things in, mm -hmm. in response to he, strife. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say just exactly the same thing, because people, <laughs> people seem nowadays to get offended real easy. Mm -hmm. You know, people shouldn't get offended easy either. either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they should be able to take a lot of guff, you know, and be able to, to go through it. And if they, if they are like that, then their love is covering over some sins. Okay. So, well, Peter, of course, talks about a couple of things. He says, 
Now, I'm not talking about suffering because you're doing wrong. That's not what we're talking about. He's talking about suffering because you're doing right. And, of course, probably the best, or let me say the most obvious example of that in Scripture would be Job. I mean, he suffered not because he did anything wrong, but because he was doing things right. And God says even up front, at the first, before the thing even started, he said, you know, Job was a perfect and an upright man. See, Now, how many people in our day do you think are actually suffering for doing right? Is that something we can, we can see around us? Well, you know, if you have a you have a life or a community that that works on bribes, mm -hmm. all of a sudden a person comes in, he doesn't want to take a bribe. He wants to do everything flat out. Well, the guy's doing it right, mm -hmm. but it kind of bugs everybody else, mm -hmm. and so they start picking on him. So, in a way, that that that's the way that that doing things right will yeah. get back at you not very nicely. Well, look at this passage in 1 Peter 3, starting with verse 8. To conclude, you must all have the same attitude and the same feelings. Love one another as brothers and sisters and be kind and humble with one another. Does that mean just with other church members? Do not pay back evil with evil or cursing with cursing. Instead, pay back with a blessing. Because a blessing is what God promised to give you when he called you. As the scripture says, whoever wants to enjoy life and wishes to see good times must keep from speaking evil and stop telling lies. They must turn away from evil and do good. They must strive for peace with all their heart. For the Lord watches over the righteous and listens to their prayers, but he opposes those who do evil. So, uh, what... In, in, in the more traditional translation, it says we're supposed to be of one mind. What does one mind mean? In harmony with, a state of atonement. Okay. You don't do things unilaterally. You know, you mm -hmm. confer, you come to an agreement, uh, and then you move together rather than in opposition to each other. Okay. God has been uh, doing that, attempted to do that, since he began to create any intelligent creatures. That was before this earth was created. Mm -hmm. Everything he's done for it is to bring harmony or to have a state of atonement for, of all of his creation. creation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that word has taken on a connotation of a, a pagan con connotation of d doing something to change God's mind by the death of Jesus, which is not taught in the Bible, but it's no. a, it's a... Well, our, our, our Bible study guide asks us to look at 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 26. Now, we don't have time to read that, but that's the place where Paul says the church is supposed to be like a body. You know, some person's an eye, another person's an ear, and some people are hands, and some people are feet. And, you know, an eye can't take the place of feet, and, and a, a body that was nothing but an eye, how would it get around, how would it move? You know that story. Is that what Peter had in mind when he talked about being of one mind? Well, the body has to move together. It has to be mm -hmm. coordinated. If one part of the body is damaged in a way that it can't get the messages, then that interferes uh, with the process. If um, the inner ear is telling you that you're moving because the car is going around corners, but your eye is looking at a book and says, no, we're not moving. Mm -hmm. That creates uh, dissonance in exactly. your, your vestibular system, and you end up with nausea and, and other things. Possibly. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I have a problem with the preceding text, though, especially uh, 1 Peter 3.12, uh -huh. because it says towards the end of that verse, the Lord is against those who do evil. I don't think the Lord is against anybody. I think there's a problem with the translation here. First of all, do is asha, which can be translated 70 different ways. Evil here is dolos in Greek. Mm -hmm. Dolos means a decoy. Mm -hmm. Those who believe in the decoy, those who look at the decoy, the decoy of what? Jesus, which means it's, they're looking at the Antichrist, mm -hmm. not at Jesus himself. So the problem God has is not with people. It's with people not looking at the real Christ. Yeah, very good. 
Thank you for that. Um, and from another perspective, uh, looking at the, we see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, so it's our purpose to see the face of God, but you can't see God and live, mm -hmm. uh, it said. So, uh, uh, it, it, there, I think what you're saying is God isn't turning his face away from those who are doing evil. I yeah. think it's more that they have done evil and therefore they are not seeing, they cannot yeah. see the face. They have turned their face away from him. Right. Well, and they're looking at the coin instead of looking at him. Yeah. Ellen White put it in these words to see what you think of these. This is Testimonies, <clears throat> Volume 9, page 188, first paragraph. Crucify self. Esteem others better than yourselves. Thus you will be brought into oneness with Christ. Before the heavenly universe and before the church and the world, you will bear unmistakable evidence that you are God's sons and daughters. Is that what Jesus was talking about when he said, everyone will know that you are Christians if you have love for one another? Mm -hmm. God will be glorified in the example that you set. Okay, right there, back there where you got, uh, thus you will be brought into oneness with Christ. That's a mm -hmm. state of harmony, a state mm -hmm. of atonement. Yeah. Okay? And you don't need to do a, a, a pagan sacrifice to, to get that around. But you look at the ideal, Jesus, get the mind of Jesus, mm -hmm. and... Uh, <laughs> but how do you get there, though? It takes process of time. Uh, you can't do it without uh, spending your some time studying. And you, so, need to, you, need to, you need to look at the example of Jesus and say, okay, in my life, how could I be as much like Jesus as possible? And you ask the Holy Spirit to help you do that, and you, you, rock, you work at that every day. And you, just part of that quote there was, if you're self-centered, it, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. it, okay, it's all, it's a, we're all born self-centered, and the proce pro problem is to, the process of getting ourselves unself-centered. Yeah. <laughs> That's being born again. Okay, there, go ahead. Okay, yeah. thank you. What's, what's that verse where whatever you do on earth will be done in heaven. Yeah, Jesus said it, that. Mm -hmm. That, in a way, is kind of a, a oneness right there. Mm -hmm. It's not that, okay, I'm going to decide to do it this way, and they're watching, and then they decided, then they do the same thing type of thing. It's just because they both, both sides There's a understand harmony. the concept. There's a, yeah. There's a harmonious, it's like uh, you ring uh, or you make a certain tone and you can have resonance within a glass that breaks it, you know, mm -hmm. which of yeah. course is a bad example, but in other words, there can be resonance. So, mm -hmm. But Jesus said, uh, prayed in John 17 that we would be one, and yeah. except for a short time at Pentecost, that prayer is still unanswered. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Jesus had unanswered prayers as, as well as we do. What, what do you think Paul had in mind when he said in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. What do you think that means? What would that look like in 2017? Thinking like Christ. There's no other way mm -hmm. to have Christ in us. How else could we have Christ? Not a person that's going to enter. Mm -hmm. It's his mindset. It's the way he lives his life, the way he thinks, which causes him to live his life the way he does. That's why the question raised here, what would we do What if we did what Christ did in the 21st century? It's not a question of what we do. It's a question of how we think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Christians almost universally rejoice over the fact that Jesus and God are so forgiving. And what does that mean? If God is so forgiving, then you can go out and do it again. Forgiveness is not salvation, and that's part of the problem. And the salvation is a matter of healing, and what needs healing is the way we think about God. Yeah. Well, think of, I mean, there's no question about God's forgiveness. Yeah, I mean, right. Jesus is out there with his hands being nailed to the cross, and he's forgiving, he's forgiving those people who are nailing him to the cross. I laid that on a, a neighbor lady uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> she has had little to say to me since that time. But I said, God forgives everybody. Mm -hmm. God is forgiveness personified. That's the way he is. The problem is we all need healing. And, yeah. uh, so. 
But is it hard for us as individual Christians, or what would be the barriers to our accepting the fact that we are, and Ellen White puts it in these words, accepted before God just as if you had not sinned, steps to Christ 62, verse 2. Is it hard for us to accept the idea that we could be accepted for Christ just as if we had never sinned? In order for us to grow, we need to be accepted of God. If we know right off the bat that we are not accepted, why would we have any incentive to grow in our love and therefore away from sin? So forgiveness is important because it's the starting oh, yeah. point yeah. of our growth and development into love. Well, when you forgive somebody, you don't think about those sins anymore because they're behind you. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you're forgetting them, but you just act as if you didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And that's part of forgiveness right there. So here's what, here's what the problem is. Christians, many Christians from various denominations are so thankful that Jesus is forgiving. And they hope that somehow or other, and I, I keep remembering the, the young man that, whose home we had uh, a biblical classes taking people through the Bible book by book for two years, meeting in his home. And he said that he was raised by a famous church, a largest Christian church, as a child. And he, he, he always prayed that if anything was going to happen to him, he would get run over on his way home from confession on Sunday morning because that was the, he thought that was the only time of the week that he could possibly be saved. Well, I mean, that's the stress, not... Yes, the, the yeah. tension that you're under. It's not a healthy relationship no. to be always, you know, married one minute and then you're not married and now you're married again and now you're, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of a on again, off again. So it's, does God give us not only forgiveness but the power to overcome sin? Yes. Thinking like Christ, which is thinking in a loving sort of way, altruistically, yeah. is a way to get away from sin. Okay. The only way to overcome sin is through greater love. Okay, look at these p passages from Peter. The, first of all, verse three, First Peter 3, I'm going to read verses 18 and 21. For Christ died for sins once and for all a good man on behalf of sinners in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually. Then dropping down to 21, which was a symbol pointing to baptism, which now uh, saves you. It is not the washing away of bodily dirt, but the promise made to God from a good conscience. It saves you from the resurrection, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have a problem with that translation. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be, if Christ died... My RSV says, for sin, once and for, for all. But wouldn't it be better to say Christ died because of sin or for the sake of sin, but not for sins? He, he, he died because, uh, because of sin. If, he, if there was no sin, he would not have needed to die. Yeah. But his purpose of his death was to show the righteousness of God, oh. not to pay a penalty, and, and uh, then you're all paid up and you go off and, and do, do as you bloody well please. And but from the standpoint of doing away with the sin problem, uh, it, it, he could, it could be said that he died for, to do away with the, the sin problem. There's a very interesting, you notice that this, I just quoted you verse 18 and verse 21. Um, we, and I don't have time to go into the details of this right now, but Verse, between verse 18 and 19, this is, many scholars consider this the toughest passage to deal with in the entire New Testament, which would probably mean the entire Old Testament as well, because it says somehow or other Christ died and then he's, spe he's speaking to people in, in no, from Noah's day and what is all of that? Now it's true that if you jump over, it's pretty clear that the linkage is talking about baptism. The, that point I think is valid, but um, the the Greek of this passage says, "In which also Christ." And maybe I should go ahead and and read you that, and let's just talk about it for a moment. For Christ died for sins once and for all, a good man on behalf of sinners, in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually, and in his spiritual existence, he went and preached to the imprisoned spirits. 
and it goes on and talks about people who are alive in the days of Noah. Now, there's a bunch of problems with these verses. First of all, you know, does that mean that Jesus didn't really die? He was just transported off in some, you know, ephemeral form, and he's going here or there and doing something. We believe that Jesus was asleep in the grave. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, how can he preach to souls that were, or spirits that were um, alive and, and what he waited patiently during the days of Noah was building a boat? And there's a possible solution to this. It turns out that the words in Greek, and hokai, at the beginning of verse 19, there are some people who think that the en hokai, they think there should have been actually the word enik next to it. En hokai henok. And it sounds almost, it, and they think that somebody was reading along and trying to copy this very early, and they dropped out the word enik because it looked like it was a, you know, en hokai henok. Remember that in, in, in the Greek, there's no, there's no spaces between the words. It's just continuous. I mean, the manuscripts just continues like this. And someone looked at it and said, oh, I already copied that, and it skips over the next word. That would make it say something like this. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually. And in his spiritual existence, Enoch went and preached to the imprisoned spirits in the days of Noah. And that would make perfect good sense. But uh, we don't have any documents that actually say that. Uh, that's a what's called a conjectural emendation, but that would make sense. But it's possible that some people have different explanations. Some people say, "Well, this is talking about Jesus who went back be actually before the time of the flood and spoke to the people in prison and so forth." It's it it can be really complicated, and so our lesson skirts around that that issue. But there's something else in verse. 3 verse 18 which I would like to ask you about I'll read it once again for Christ died for sins once and for all the little Greek word is hapax once and for all it just means it happened once it's good for all what what do you suppose that implies so you, you see if you take that to mean that somehow or rather Christ's death is a payment for each individual sin that we commit that's almost like an indulgence because Christ paid 2,000 years ago, and I'm still committing sins today. Is that, I mean, how can that be? You know, the, the word for is oop, hooper in Greek, mm -hmm. which is uh, for the sake of, okay. as opposed to for sin. For forgiveness, we inject that into the text when we read it. It's for the sake of, in other words, to help us overcome sin. Mm -hmm. How? He died, he went all the way to his death to show us that love does not stop short of death. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that, maybe we will overcome a lot more sin. And once and for all means that that's the end. That, that's as far as it can go. And you don't keep doing it every day or every Sunday or... Yeah, but you, there would be no point to it because it, this is the end. I mean, there's no further he can go. Only one demonstration so, was necessary. Well, through baptism, some would suggest, and it seems to, Peter seems to be suggesting that, we are supposed to experience a closeness to Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection that inspires us to a new life. I remember my friend Dr. Graham Maxwell used to say, well, when, you're, when you, you bury the old man in baptism, you rise to new life, you've got an old man, you've got a new man. And the problem is that most of us keep opening up the coffin and keep slipping a sandwich to the old man. You know, <laughs> it's a very graphic way of sort of representing that. But we're supposed to be feeding the new man, not the old man. So anyway. Well, it's a matter of renewing the way we think. Mm -hmm. We are born with a certain mindset, which is very self-centered. And baptism is all about recognizing the problem that comes with that mindset and wanting to go in a different direction, which is that of Christ, others first. Yeah. Do you often feel like you're suffering in the flesh when you try to fight against sin? What, what does it actually mean to crucify self? Now, you know, there have been a few people who have tried to literally arrange for their own crucifixion to try to make a statement. But I'm sure that's not what he was talking about. What, what does this mean to crucify self? 
Well, the, the, the path of least resistance is mm -hmm. for us to just do what comes naturally, which is... What everybody else is doing. Right, and to not have faith in God, not to love God, but uh, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. Uh, so there, it is a, it does challenge us. It's not like, oh, we're now able to put that away and without any effort. There, uh, in Hebrews it says uh, that uh, that all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who've been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. In other words, mm -hmm. at first when we're trying to uh, reckon the old man is dead and walk in newness of life, there's a great struggle there. Uh, mm -hmm. But once we mm -hmm. settle into the truth about God... <laughs> the, the, the example probably... It becomes easier. Yeah. One, one of the main examples in Scripture would probably be the story of Moses. I'm sure it wasn't easy. Maybe it's a wonderful thing that he killed that Egyptian. It might have been hard for him to leave the comforts and everything of, of, of Egyptian life and to go off into the desert. I'm sure he had no idea he was headed out for 40 years of watching sheep. You know, it probably wasn't easy. Well, what does it mean? Let's, let's try some options. Does crucifying self mean we must eat only what is healthy? Is that crucifying self? Does crucifying self mean at work you always go the extra mile? So somebody else is slacking a little bit, so you cover part of what they should have done, and you sort of help them out. Is that what it means to crucify self? Well, that might enable them. <laughs> you don't want to become well, an enabler, enabler of that's people. One, that's part of the question. Yeah, but we should, whatever we, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we should do to the glory of God. So. Uh, if we try to really live lives like Jesus, could we even suffer mocking by family or friends? Absolutely. Yeah. So how much time do we spend, and I'm not asking for any of you in particular, but to think about this, how much time do we spend reaching out to others with trying to somehow reach out to them with the gospel? Or do we spend, uh, and how much time do we spend reading and studying the scriptures? Or how much time do we spend on movies, television, Facebook, Twitter, etc.? I don't even, I don't even, I can't even keep up with all these. I think the latest one is Snapchat or something like that. That's probably out of, out of tune already. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I know people who, I mean, their lives are centered in yeah. Texting on one or the other of those kinds of things. I mean, that can't be God's plan for us. Walking to lamp poles while they're doing it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. A lot of us uh, spend more time perhaps uh, with politics and concerned with politics as opposed to studying the Word of God and especially Jesus, His life. Uh, if we did more of that, maybe we would need a whole lot less of the politics. <laughs> well, for people who, who, who are baptized and became Christians later in life, it might be easier for them to look back and, and, and say, okay, now I can, I, I, I can identify in my own mind what it was like before I became a Christian and now what it's like after a Christian. What about those of us who, I mean, I'm a fourth generation. Seventh-day Adventist. And my grandchildren are sixth generation Seventh-day Adventists. Um, do we need to sort of, at least in our minds, step out of the church for a little bit and say, what would, be, what would it be like to live an unchristian life? Or, or should we just be thankful that we didn't have to do that? Well, maybe we need to realize that that we're all uh, born separated from God. We're yeah. all, and even as good as we think we are, and, and perhaps with we have many good habit patterns, that that is not the same as, as knowing God. Mm -hmm. Knowing about God is not the same as knowing God. As knowing God. There's a difference. The there. parent can't learn for the children. I mean, it, it, you, we Ezekiel, do learn a lot from our children. Yeah, but Ezekiel 18 <laughs> in this uh, 
son won't die for the sins yeah. of the father. Yeah. But the reverse of that is also true. Yeah. You, you the parent cannot learn for the kids, or the kids can't uh, learn for them. No, no, it's a uh, individual. Peter goes on there in chapter four, verses three to six, and he says. <clears throat> Former lives of those Christians, and this is one of the verses that really raises a question about whether he's talking to Gentiles or whether he's talking to former Jews or what. But he says, you used to live lives of indecency, lust, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and the disgusting worship of idols. Now, people point to that and they say, there's no way he could have been talking about former Jews with all of that. What do you think? Well, not... Pharisees, perhaps. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Maybe some of the. If you, if you. The publicans, perhaps. If you go out to the, go back to the Old Testament and you read what was going on in Hosea's day, or maybe yeah. Second, Second Kings at the end of the Northern Kingdom, you might think it was like that. Well, and I, I would like to throw a question to you out there as well. Would popular movies or other forms of modern entertainment fit any of those categories? I'll let you think about that. Vicarious. Yeah. Or would you be participating it should, it should, in those things vicariously? Yeah. You know, it, you can bring the Lord into a lot more things than you think. Mm -hmm. And um, he'll straighten you out. Mm -hmm. Only if this running away from him doesn't always do it. Yeah. You have to take him in with you, and then he'll show you a, few, a thing or two. Do you think uh, Christianity would ever be... Uh, uh, in a line with drunken parties. There again. What do you do? Run away from them? If you go to drunken parties all the time and you hear about the Lord, well, take the Lord with you to one of those drunken parties. Something might I, might start changing in your mind right then. It depends I, on what you mean <laughs> by drunken parties. Yeah, there, are, right. there are parties and then there are I mean, uh, I work for Kaiser, and uh, every fifth year they give us awards for our being there so so many years. And and there's alcohol there when they have yeah. the the program, and there are people that imbibe. I <laughs> so I would I would have to t I have to tell you, and I find I find this amusing. I was attending Johns Hopkins University to get my master's in public health degree a number of years ago, many years ago. And one of our teachers invited us over on a, for Saturday night to get acquainted a little better with, couple, they had, he had invited two or three of our teachers and a bunch of our fellow students. So we were there to get acquainted. And my wife and I walked in and he introduced us to the people around the room. And the last, last two people he introduced us, introduced us to were two ladies who were both drinking beer at that point in time. One of them turned to me and said, do you call yourself a missionary? Because we, apparently she'd heard me say something about having worked in Africa or something, because this was after we'd spent four years in Africa. So I'm, I'm assuming that's what led her to make that question. And I said, that's, that's not an easy question. She says, I know the answers to the easy questions. I want to know, do you consider yourself to be a missionary? And I said, well, yes, I do. And she says, okay, I have another question for you. And she started off. And I won't, I, it, we, could, we spent a long time thinking about the questions that I, she kept bringing all sorts of crazy questions to me. And um, she ended up being a professor at Longland University. Hmm. That's the only, you know, that it, it was advertised as a mar martini party, I think he called it. And she says, but no, you don't have to drink alcohol, just come... There's soft drinks and there's water and so forth. But we, I went, that's the only time I ever went to one of those and ended up winning some, somebody for the gospel. Well, here's a couple more comments from Ellen White. What do you think of these? The most difficult sermon to preach and the hardest to practice is self-denial. View and Herald, January 31, 1907. I think about, uh, you've probably all heard this, Francis of Assisi is supposed to have said at some point, um, Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Yeah. Ellen White goes on in another place. Our words, our actions, our deportment, our dress, everything should preach. Not only with our words should we speak to the people, but everything pertaining to our person should be a sermon to them. 
that, that right impressions may be made upon them and that the truth spoken may be taken by them to their homes. Thus our faith will stand in a better light before the community. Testimonies, Volume 2, pages, page 617, paragraph 3. And another place. Do we consider and realize that the greatest influence to recommend Christianity to our world is a well-ordered and well-disciplined Christian family? The world sees that they believe God's word. And funny, one more. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more on behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Wow. Such a family gives evidence that the parents have been successful in following God's directions and that their children will serve Him in the church. Their influence grows, for as they impart, they receive to impart again. The father and mother find helpers in their children who give to others the instruction received in the home. The neighborhood in which they live is helped, for in it they have become enriched for time and for eternity. The whole family is engaged in the service of the Master, and by their godly examples, others are inspired to be faithful and true to God in dealing with this flock, his beautiful flock. That was Review and Herald, June 6, 1899. It's also in Adventist Home 32, paragraph 1. So then Peter moves on after he's talking about why we should become serious questions, be Christians and even be willing to be persecuted for our Christianity. He talks about the judgment. Is, is Peter the only one in the Bible who talks about the judgment? <laughs> A lot of places talk about the judgment the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 29, for example, says, And come out of their graves, this is the dead, those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. For 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, this is Paul, For all of us must appear before Christ to be judged by Him. We will each receive what we deserve according to everything we have done, good or bad, in our bodily life. So, one of the, and then he, some, Hebrews 9.27 talks about something similar. 1 Peter 4, verse 3, moving on, uses a couple of Greek words that, um, tell, tell me what you think of this. One of those words is aselgia, which means sensuality, and the other word is epistomia, which means lust or desire. Considering how perverse, pervasive the world's idea of sexuality has become, and may be for hard for us to remember that God created sex. The Bible is not against sex in the right context between a man and his wife. Sex can be one, a wonderful attraction and a great producer of closeness and intimacy. In fact, God has used the marriage relationship as a symbol of his relationship with his people, with the church, and even in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 3, Ezekiel 16, Hosea 1 to 3, and so forth. I'd like to go back to uh, the, the passage there about judgment. Mm -hmm. We need to bring in uh, uh, what uh, Gospel of John, uh, chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. Yeah. I do not judge him. Uh, the words I have spoken will be his judge. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't judge anybody. He's already spoken the words, and if you don't want to listen or spend any time, <laughs> you're, uh, you will have already judged yourself. Yeah. Well, just a, a little bit of note about some of the implications of sexual sins that's covered in our lesson. A recent CNN report estimated that the total cost to society of a single rape is up to $640,000. The best, and, and now I'll read you an actual piece from a, a one that was a few years before that. The best available research tells us that crime victimization costs the United States $450 billion annually. That was a 1996 report. <laughs> Rape is the most costly of all crimes to its victims, with total estimated costs at, at $127 billion a year, excluding the cost of child sexual abuse. That means you leave the child sexual abuse out of it completely. In 2008, that's a few years ago, Researchers estimated that each rape cost approximately $151,423. That was a study done by Delisi. <laughs> Sexual abuse has a negative impact on children's educational attainment, later job performance and earnings. Sexual violence survivors experience reduced income in adulthood as a result of victimization in adolescence with a lifetime income loss estimated at $241,600. So there's 
almost your $460,000, and that was almost 10 years ago from those, those studies. Sexual abuse interferes with a woman's ability to work. 50% of sexual violence victims had to quit or were forced to leave their jobs in the year following their assaults due to the severity of their reactions. In 2008, violence and abuse constituted up to 37.5% of total health care costs, or up to $750 billion. Wow. And that's, if you get our handout, uh, that's, it'll, you have the reference there. You can look it up online. Of course, those who understand the teachings of the Bible and do not, do not, not anyone, do not need anyone to teach them, to tell them that, because that's spread out on the pages of Scripture, isn't it? Well, Peter goes on, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, he says, after the judgment is what's going to come? The end of all things. So how should we behave in light of the possibility that the end of all things is coming? Well, he says we need to be self-controlled. We need to be alert. We need to be prayerful. We need to love one another earnestly. We need to open our homes to each other without complaining. We need to use for the good of others the special gifts we have received from God. Um, are we supposed to overlook and forgive every sin committed by a fellow believer? We've talked about the fact that love covers a multitude of sins. Does that mean just no matter what anybody else does, we just oh, overlook that? Well, it might mean that they need a special outpouring of grace, and so uh, loving them uh, in a way that uh, lifts them up and out of, or turns their focus away from what's producing those mm -hmm. uh, behaviors and that way of thinking, Yeah, as Fred would say. <laughs> in uh, Counsels to Parents, Ellen White says, the love that suffers long and is kind will not magnify an indiscretion into an unpardonable offense. Neither will it make capital of others' misdoings. The scriptures plainly teach that the erring are to be treated with forbearance and consideration. If the right course is followed, the apparently obdurate heart may be won to Christ. The love of Jesus covers a multitude of sins. And there's her comment. His grace never leads to the exposing one another's wrongs unless it is a positive necessity. So if someone is practicing open sin and everybody knows about it, then the church probably needs to take action. But uh, short of that, it's better to try to deal with them, try to convince them. Remember Matthew 18, go to, you, go to them yourself. If necessary, take someone else with you, try to talk to them. If necessary, discuss the church. And if necessary, move on. You all remember very well the story of the woman taken into adultery in John 8, 1 to 11. It's, um, it's almost certainly true that the men who brought her as a supposed trap for Jesus, because they thought no matter what, if Jesus said, kill her, stone her, they would accuse him to the Romans. If he said, let her go, then of course they would say, well, you're not upholding the law, upholding the law of Moses. So they thought they had an airtight case. They're going to just nail Jesus right on the spot. So what did Jesus do? Well, the sins of those men who brought her and who undoubtedly set her up were probably much worse than her sins. Jesus could have written their sins into the marble walls of the temple. Imagine if he had done that. But he did not. He wrote them in the dust of the ground. A few puffs of wind, a few footsteps, they would be gone. We don't know exactly what he wrote, but it is clear from their responses that there was enough detail so that, so that they felt individually guilty. Does Jesus like to make us feel guilty? I would suggest only if it leads to a change in our behavior. Right. In Proverbs it says that if uh, we persist in our rebellion, he will send a cruel messenger against us. Yeah. But that's not as, you know, he'll do whatever he has to do to get our attention. But. Um, but that's not its first. One of the biggest evils in our world today, just sort of trying to cover everything that Peter talks about here, is drugs. People using street drugs and so forth like that. Um, what do you think Jesus would say about those? 
I, maybe there's no question about that. Is the trouble with those drugs that you lose self-control? They refuse the vinegar on the cross. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us about yeah. drugs? Yeah, very good. Well, Peter then sums up in a couple of places. First Peter 3, 8 and 9, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. About a chapter later in 1 Peter 4, verse 7, I'm now reading from the Good News Bible, we're to be self-controlled and alert, to be able to pray, and above everything, love one another earnestly because love covers over many sins. We've already talked about that. Are we as Christians really awaiting? Are we really looking forward to the coming of Jesus? The older we get, more, more imminent it becomes, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to notice a number of, of a number of surveys have been done of Christians. You know, when do you think Jesus is going to come again? And the average is about five years after I die. <laughs> 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 I have to smile when you think about that. Um, well, thinking about all these things, and we, Peter goes on and on, we can't cover every thing he, he touches on just briefly. It's very clear that agape love is not typical of people in our world. This is a complete change in our behavior, and that's something that describes only Christians. It couldn't possibly describe worldlings. If we think of the example of Jesus, what, what things strike you about the example of Jesus? Well, he never sinned. That certainly makes him different, right? He suffered a great deal. Um, in what sense do you think Jesus became, one of the expressions here is he, be, he became perfect through his suffering. What would that mean? He became perfect. Does that mean he wasn't perfect before he came down to this earth? Well, he became sin for us. Okay. Which probably means that he could have sinned, mm -hmm. as we all can, <laughs> and we know it. And uh, Jesus, because he was educated by God, mm -hmm. uh, learned what true love is, mm -hmm. how to become more loving, mm -hmm. and that love never stops. He, which also means that Jesus had to learn through his suffering. By suffering, we learn how wicked and how devastating sin can be. And what is sin? Lack of love. Yeah. Now, you're not suggesting, I'm sure, that Jesus didn't know about loving when he was back in heaven, before well, he came Of to course, but he became human. He left his divinity up there. So what we would say here then would be that the Father and the Son had a plan. Mm -hmm. And when he came to this earth, the idea is, I'm going I'm to do this plan exactly as we planned it. So his being perfected through suffering was he followed those details that God had, that the two of them had worked out before exactly. And he proved that he was capable of doing what... Uh, and here's an interesting comment from our SDA Bible commentary. See what you think about this. Had Christ come to this world and spent his allotted time in peace and contentment, guarded by heavenly angels and protected from the hazards and temptations common to man, he would not have been perfected for, from his, for his office. He would have had no opportunity to demonstrate what he would do under pressure. Had he not been tempted in all points, men would have wondered what he would do if he were really hungry and tired out and sick. What he would do if men sh should revile him, curse him, spit upon him, scourge him, and at last hang him on a cross. Would he still retain his composure and pray for his enemies? If those whom he trusted should forsake him, deny him, betray him, and desert him in his supreme hour, would he, undiscouraged, commit himself to God? If, as a climax, God himself should appear to forsake him and the horror of darkness envelop him and nearly crush him, would he still drink the cup or would he draw back? Such questions men would ask if he had been shielded from temptations and suffering. So I think that's a very good thing for us to think about. Um, well, actually, if he's shielded from temptation, well, then we won't be able to see how he reacts to it. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think if he was shielded, he still wouldn't have sinned. 
Mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think that 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 was his training there. Mm -hmm. I think it was he was poked so much that everybody saw his reaction, and then they learned from it. In in our Bible commentary, it also says this is a comment on Hebrews five verses eight and nine. By becoming man, by facing the temptations of life as a man, Christ gained this knowledge. He thus met one of the essential qualifications for the high priesthood, namely that the appointee become belong to the human family. Now, that's not suggesting that, I hope, that's not suggesting that Jesus came to this earth so he could learn something that the Father doesn't know. Uh, I think he just came to demonstrate so that we could see yes. that the Father understands all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to drop down. Here's a comment on that First Peter uh, 3, 18 and 19 verse. The difficult part of that passage in verse 19 to 20 introduces the story of the great flood in order to set up the idea of Noah's Ark as a symbol for baptism in 1 Peter 3, 21. The spirits in prison, from that's the translation of the New King James Version, refer to the antediluvians who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Verse 20, Christ preached the gospel in the spirit to those who are dead, not through the preaching of Noah so that there would be a basis for their judgment. First Peter 4, 6. They are referring to, referred to as spirits in prison because they are metaphorically held or reserved for judgment at the last day. And compare Second Peter 2, 4, 9, and Jude 6, and Revelation 21 to 3. So in conclusion to our study for this section of First Peter, which, what evidences do we show in our lives that we are dedicated to God with a sense of the imminence of His coming? How would do you live differently each day if we believed it was our last would it be different if we knew that Jesus were coming tomorrow? Peter talks quite a bit about that. Christians are, were often misunderstood back in New Testament times because of our communion services. People said, oh, they, they eat blood and they drink, they, I mean, they drink blood and they eat body. They must be cannibals. And then they, talk, they complained about us because we were so friendly. Maybe they're involved in some kind of incest or something like that. But do our friends and neighbors, co-workers that we think we are strange, what do they think about you? Do they, do they worry or do they think that you're really bizarre? Our kind and loving Father, it's a wonderful privilege to live lives according to your will. We pray that this opportunity has been given us that we may come to know you better and to realize more why you came to live and die on this earth. And may that be an opportunity for each one of us to come nearer to you and live more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.